Now, I have a few clips that I wanted to play for you, but before we get into that, I wanted to look at the discussion that we had in the comment section that we, that we started, because I think we can glean some insights from it. And uh, I think it'll segue nicely into the rest of this uh, refutation. All right, here we go. So I started out, I asked Kel, I said, I'm not saying Christ doesn't hand the kingdom over to the Father, because it's clear that he does, 1 Corinthians 15. And he, he no longer reigns, okay? He, his, his reign, he reigns only up until the point where his enemies are, are subjected to him, and then he hands the kingdom over to his Father. And Kel points that out, and Kel is actually, he's, he's correct about that. So I'm not, I'm not disputing that, but if 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 14 says that David's descendant, that is Christ, would sit upon his throne forever, then how can Christ reign, how can Christ's reign ever end? And then Kell's reply, now this is his, his argument, this is how he gets around this, this contradiction that we obviously have. There's obviously a contradiction if Christ reigns forever and yet he doesn't reign forever. And the way he, he resolves this contradiction is he says that the Hebrew olam, he says, notice how it does not and cannot mean forever and ever in any of the following verses. And then he gives a bunch of verses. I'm not going to read them all. You can go ahead. Uh, you can look at the, the comments and read that for yourself if you'd like. I responded, what about the verses where olam must mean forever and ever? Kel says, like... And now right here, here's red flag goes up because uh, what do you mean like? I mean, didn't he do some research on that word before he made that argument that uh, there's certain texts in which Alam can't mean forever and forever? Because if he had, he, he would have surely seen that there are many places in the, in, in the Old Testament. And there are probably more places in the Old Testament where Alam has to mean forever and forever than there are where it doesn't. And so I replied, and I sent him a bunch of verses where it absolutely has to mean forever. And again, I'm not going to bother to read all those. You can, you can look at the discussion yourself. Kell's reply was, you failed on the very first citation. Using the Greek terminology, it literally says, L of the eon. L of the eon. What does that mean? Using the Greek terminology. First of all, L, okay, that's not Greek, that's Hebrew. That's Hebrew. Hebrew that's, that means God. El is Hebrew for God. Of the is English, and eon, I, I guess the, the Greek word he's, he's grasping for there is, is ion, which, which means age, or in certain t contexts it, it means eternity. So I don't know what he means by El of the eon is the Greek terminology. I, <laughs> he lost me on that one. But I said, you know what? Let me go ahead and check the Greek Septuagint and see what that actually says. Let me see how the Greek translators themselves, the, 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 the translators who translated the Greek Septuagint, let me see how they understood the Hebrew olam. And I responded, the Greek Septuagint translates it, ta'anama kuriu theu, uh, theos ionias, which literally means the name of Yahweh, the eternal God. Okay, olam means eternal God. Uh, so, so, so much for me failing on the very first citation. Well, not to be corrected, because Kell will not be corrected, and he will not admit that uh, he's made a, he's made a uh, bad argument, he's made a false claim, that's just not his way. So he answered and he said, Notice that David said this promise was fulfilled in Solomon. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. What happened to the explanation that Alam doesn't mean forever and forever in certain passages. What happened to that? That's what I want to know. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you what happened to it. It didn't work. That's what happened to it. So again, not to be deterred, he moves on to something else. And it, it took him a while to get back to me. I thought, see, every time I have these discussions with Kel in the comment section, I never fail to refute him. It has never happened that I've failed to refute him. And I thought, since I hadn't heard from him for a while, that he, he finally got the message. Well, then this notification turns up, and now he's trying to say that the promise was actually fulfilled in Solomon. Well, 
That's not true. He knows that's true. That promise is fulfilled in Christ. Hebrews 1, 5 says, if you read the very next verse in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the very next verse, God says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Well, where have you heard that before? Hebrews 1, 5. The promise is fulfilled in Christ, not Solomon. And then he goes on to make some reason why it has to be Solomon. He ends up, he says, Chronicles 22 through 10. Now, did Solomon reign forever? Was it plausible for David to even say such a thing about Solomon? Or does it even mean forever? Then he snarkily adds, I know that confuses you, but it's your homework you need to do, not mine. Well, uh, trust me, Kel, I've done my homework. And what you're saying, you are, again, you are distorting the scriptures. That passage was not fulfilled in Solomon. It was fulfilled in Christ, according to the writer of Hebrews. So uh, if you don't agree with that, take it up with him. But that is, in fact, the case. So that's where we are. With Kel desperately trying to salvage his anti-Trinitarian position at the expense of biblical truth. Uh, that's what he would have me believe. That's what he would have you believe. Yes, all you all, all you followers of Kel who, in the comment section, you're a great video, Kel. I always look forward to your next video, Kel. Uh, great job, Kel. Kel would actually have you believe that 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 14 was fulfilled in Solomon, not Christ even though the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 1.5 says it was fulfilled in Christ, not Solomon. So there you go. As, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, he, he even says himself, yeah, here it is. Then God chose David. Now David was God's Christ, God's chosen king of Israel. David sat on the throne of God over the kingdom of God. Then God made a promise to David. This promise concerned Jesus. Not Solomon, Jesus. God promised that his descendant would sit upon his throne forever. 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 14 and Luke 1, 32, which we'll look at later. But again, Kel admits it right here. Then God made a promise to David. This promise concerned Jesus. Jesus. So what's he talking about? It was fulfilled in Solomon. Well, he had to shift to that because his original explanation didn't work and he realized it. So now instead of just standing corrected, which Kel can't do, that's just not his way. He had to come up with something, you know, really quick. And so he says that the promise was actually fulfilled in Solomon. When he knows And he even teaches in this video that it was not fulfilled in Solomon. It was fulfilled in Christ. Kel is not an honest man. You can see right here, he's not an honest man. He goes against what he said in his own video, just to save face. That's the type of individual that we're dealing with with Kel. That's why I said he needs to be exposed for the false teacher that he is. Okay, we're back with the, our examination of the video we're currently uh, looking at. If you saw that video, uh, you're probably, you might be saying to yourself, but what about 1 Corinthians 15? I mean, doesn't that say that Christ will reign only until all things are subject to him? And then at that time, he'll hand the kingdom back over to the Father? Well, it does, and we'll look at exactly how that needs to be understood. I say it needs to be understood because otherwise we have a direct contradiction in Scripture. I mean, on the one hand, on one hand, Christ reigns forever, and yet on the other hand, Christ only reigns intermediately. Uh, well, which one is it? When we look at 1 Corinthians 15, I hope that you'll see that it's only the Trinity that gives us a way out of what would otherwise be a direct contradiction in Scripture. Again, does Christ reign forever or does he not reign forever? Scripture teaches both. How do we resolve that? The Trinity has the solution. All right, here's clip number one. So Jesus is going to subject himself to the Father. 
which means in this context and always when it me it always means this when you use this Greek word in the New Testament that the, you'll be subjecting yourself so that the per, to a person who will be your higher authority whoever you're subjecting yourself to is now going to be your higher authority all right um that statement is simply false it's not true First Corinthians uh, five twenty says, "Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ." Okay, the word there for submit in this passage is the same word that's used in in First Corinthians in the First Corinthians fifteen passage. Clearly, when we subject ourselves to one another according to this passage, we're not submitting to a higher authority. We submit in obedience and out of reverence to the one who is our ultimate authority, namely Christ. Now, if I know Kel, and I think I do, he's going to argue that, well, by submitting to someone, they are by definition in authority over you by virtue of your having submitted to them. Uh, but surely he's not suggesting that a brother or sister now has an actual objective authority over you. Uh, because it works both ways. They're commanded to submit to you, just as you're commanded to submit to them. But if Kel wants to press this argument, then how does he suppose he'll apply this to Christ and the Father? I mean, is, is Kel going to say that the Father has no true objective authority over Christ? That Christ is in, has complete ontological equality with the Father? So that his submission to the Father is entirely voluntary? Is that where Kel wants to go? I don't think so. Uh, so when he says that the word always means this uh, when it's used in the New Testament, he's simply making a false claim. The word does not always mean to submit to a higher authority. Sorry. What's even more disturbing about this is the word is only used 11 times in the entire New Testament. I mean, how hard would it have been to look up the references to verify that indeed the word always means to submit to a higher authority whenever it's used in the New Testament? How hard would that have been? Uh, or, or did Cal look up those references and discover that there was one verse standing in his way? And knowing that no one in his flock would bother to check the accuracy of what he was saying anyway, uh, he ignored that reference rather than weaken his case by admitting to one exception. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, all I know is that whether he erred because of shoddy research or purposeful deception, he shows himself to be someone you don't need to be listening to. Okay, here is clip number two. First, you have to think about something if you're a Trinitarian. Why would the second person of the Trinity be handing over? over the kingdom to the Father. What sense is that going to make? How does that make any sense? If the Father and Son are co-equal and both are the only true God, they both rightly reign over their own creation forever, according to your own claims. All right, according to our own claims, well... Yeah, we do claim that, but so does uh, so does the scripture. Daniel seven fourteen says, "And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." Psalm 89, 36, and 37, His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever. Psalm 89, 29, I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. Hebrews 1, 8, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Isaiah 9, 7. Of the increase of his government and of the peace, there will be no end. 
on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Luke 1, 32 and 33, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high God and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. So it is not simply the Trinitarian doctrine that teaches that Christ will reign forever. Scripture clearly tells us that Christ will, in fact, reign forever and forever. Okay, now remember something. Kel is familiar with all these passages. And remember what his defense was, his explanation was when I, when I challenged him. He said that uh, the word uh, olam doesn't always mean forever and forever. Well, as he saw, that, that, that explanation doesn't work because there are passages in the Old Testament and there are probably more in the Old Testament where it has to mean forever and forever uh, than it means, uh, you know, for a long period of time. Or, uh, or some other meaning. By the way, I checked every single one of these references, except for the ones in the New Testament, in the Greek Septuagint. And in fact, the translators of the Septuagint also understand the words that are used. Some, sometimes it's the word olam is used. Sometimes I don't know Hebrew. Uh, I know a couple words. Uh, I'm pretty good in Greek. Uh, I've been studying Greek for quite a, quite a while. Um, not familiar with Hebrew at all, I'll admit to you. Um, but uh, except uh, all the all the places where um, either olam is used or another Hebrew word meaning forever, the translators of the Greek Septuagint did in fact understand those words to be saying forever, eternally. The same way our English translators understand those terms to mean forever. So Kel seems to be the only one who thinks they mean something other than what everybody else in the world uh, seems to believe that they mean. Um, and then, of course, we saw uh, how Kell's uh, second line of defense was to try to show that the um, second Samuel was not, um, was not fulfilled in Christ. It was actually fulfilled in Solomon. And, of course, we saw how that just is entirely unbiblical. Um, Hebrews 1.5 clearly says that uh, the father says to the son today, or he says, um, I will be a father to him. He will be a son to me. Um, quoting it uh, right out of 2 Samuel chapter 7. Okay, uh, I want to I want to get into um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's bring it up here. And we'll be reading out of the NASB, starting with verse 24. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he abo has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says, but when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subject, subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be all and all. Okay, so what's going on in this passage? Um, it clearly states... For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. It specifically says until. Now, a lot of times, uh, and people will point this out, that when an English translation says until, it doesn't necessarily mean until point B, but not after. Uh, and this is true. There are many places in the, both the Old and New Testament where it's translated until, and yet it doesn't mean that the action of the main verb ceases when the until is reached. Uh, for instance, I believe uh, the International Standard Version 
uh, translates Matthew 28, 20. And remember, I am with you each and every day until the end of the age. Obviously, that doesn't mean Christ is only going to be with us until the end of the age, at which point he's going to um, abandon us. Uh, we can't say that this passage uh, is one of those instances where until doesn't mean until. If it did, well, that would clear things up right there. Now, that would completely destroy Kell's position, but at least we would have a, an explanation uh, for the apparent contradiction that we see between 1 Corinthians 15 and all the other passages that we looked at earlier. Um, now, I want to do another screen presentation because I want to say something. Whenever this word is used in the Greek, it always has this meaning. <laughs> Okay, so where have we heard that before? Um, yeah, I want to, when I say something like the word always means this, uh, I, uh, I will support that with documentation. And I just want to show you that uh, this word does, in fact, mean until point B and not after. Okay, here is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Uh, the Greek states for... It is necessary him to rule or reign until, and actually it's this entire, it's this phrase here, akri hu, it's a phrase, it's not a word, it's a phrase. Whenever that phrase is used in the New Testament, it always means up until point B, but not after. And we can see that pretty easily and pretty quickly. Okay, it's used a total of five times, not a, not a big uh, sampling, but you can see each and every time it means until and not after. Uh, Luke 21, 24, uh, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Acts 17, 18, until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph, Romans 11, 25 says, A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And finally, our passage, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So, clearly, when the word when we translate the Greek into English until, it does in fact have that meaning until, but not after. Okay, so clearly we have a problem here. 1 Corinthians 15 clearly teaches that Jesus does not reign eternally, but he reigns only up until the point at which his enemies are made subject to him, after which point he hands the kingdom back over to his father. And yet we saw at least seven passages which clearly teach that Jesus' reign will be eternal. Okay, his throne will be an eternal throne. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. So how do we resolve this? And then more, more specifically, how do, how, if you're a Unitarian, how do you resolve this? I was just talking to a Unitarian last night in the comments section. And uh, I, I asked him this question. I say, how do you resolve the apparent uh, contradiction between 1 Corinthians 15 and everything else Scripture teaches about the reign of Christ? And he, um, he, didn't even, he didn't even answer the question. He didn't even address the question. So I asked him again. I said, uh, again, how do, you, how do you resolve the, the, the apparent problem we have between 1 Corinthians and everything else Scripture teaches about the reign of Christ? And I haven't heard back from him. And I don't uh, suspect suspect I will be hearing back from him. The fact is, Unitarianism simply does not have a solution to this problem. If Unitarianism is the correct position, then Scripture cannot be true. If Unitarianism is true, Scripture must be false. Okay, they both can't be true at the same time. Um, that's, that's, that's just the way it is. Um, from a Trinitarian perspective, there's no problem at all. I, as a Trinitarian, have no problems. I can explain this easily. Um, that's why I say the Trinity provides the solution 
to so many problems in the New Testament, which would otherwise leave us with irreconcilable contradictions. And that's why the Trinity is a solution, not a problem. Um, and f from a Trinitarian perspective, it's, it's, it's actually quite simple. Uh, the human king, uh, Jesus, will resign his mediatorial rule, uh, that rule having fulfilled his purpose, and he will take his seat on the throne of God with his Father and rule forever exactly as Scripture teaches. But he'll do so as God, so that the people will have only one king, namely God. Now, um, just to just to show you that I'm not making this stuff up, I mean, this, that's what... That's what Kel typically does. He just comes up with stuff off the top of his head um, and he puts it out there for, for your consumption. Um, things that you can't trace any further back into history than his video. It's as far back as you're going to go. Albert Barnes in his commentary, uh, he has this to say, um, quote, the son also himself the term Son of God is applied to the Lord Jesus with reference to his human nature, his incarnation by the Holy Spirit, and his resurrection from the dead. It does not mean that the second person of the Trinity as such should be subject to the first. And this gets back to what Kel was saying earlier, that uh, now if you're a Trinitarian, uh, what sense does it make that the second person of the Trinity would be subjecting himself to the Father? Well, it doesn't make any sense. Because the, the second person of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity, does not subject himself to the Father, and we're going to look at why that is a little bit later. The mediator, the man that was born and that was raised from the dead, to whom this wide dominion had been given, should resign that dominion, and that the government should be reassumed by the divinity as God. This does not mean, evidently, that the union of the divine and the human nature will be dissolved nor that important purpose may not be answered by the continued union forever, nor that the divine perfection uh, may not shine forth in some glorious way through the man, Christ Jesus, but that the purpose of government shall no longer be exercised in that way. The mediatorial kingdom as such shall no longer be continued and power shall be exercised by God as God. Okay, now that's Albert Barnes. So, there's the answer. From a Trinitarian perspective, it's very easy. The human Christ, the, the man, the, the eternal Logos that became flesh, okay, he will hand over his mediatorial role, he will cease his mediatorial role, and submit himself to the Father. And then, having done that, he will reassume uh, his eternal role along with the Father as God. Um, in his work, uh, Prepositions and Theology, um, Murray Harris uh, notes that in Revelation 7, uh, there's only one throne. There's only one throne with two occupants. Okay, he points out that the prepositional phrase en meso indicates a close proximity to the throne by the use of the ep exegetic chi, uh, or, and, or and as in English. And the phrase animason refers to the very center of the throne where the Father is seated. Again, one throne, two occupants. Okay? Uh, I, can, I can provide uh, everything that uh, Murray said there to anybody who wants it. Just request it in the comment section. I, I can send that to you and uh, you can look that up yourself. If you're a Unitarian and you take issue with the way I've explained these things, uh, these passages, then how do you, as a Unitarian, resolve the contradiction in Scripture, which teaches that Christ will reign forever, and at the same time, he will not reign forever? I'm afraid that far too many Unitarians are going to opt to just live with the contradiction in Scripture than to change their belief system, uh, so as to bring the Scriptures in harmony. As for me, as a Trinitarian, there is no disharmony. The Trinity provides the perfect solution to the problem Christ, in his humanity, ceases his mediatorial reign and hands the kingdom over to the Father and then assumes his reign with the Father as the eternal Lagos, who, according to John 1.1 1, 1, uh, and Titus 2.13, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Hebrews 1.8, 1, John 8.58, 20, and others, was, is, and always will be 
God. That's it. Kel, I have issued you this challenge before, and I'll issue it again. If you believe that your teachings can survive cross-examination in a live debate, come online and let's debate these things, all right? You have a standing challenge, sir. Don't disappoint me. <laughs> all right, hopefully you found uh, this useful. Um, if there's a particular teaching by Kel you don't quite know how to respond to and you'd like me to address it, just provide that link in the comment section and uh, I'll be happy to do my best to provide a biblical response uh, to that. Uh, so that's it for this video. I promise there will be more to come. Uh, for some of you, that's a promise. I imagine for others of you, that's a more of a warning. Uh, but either way, I pray that God blesses it uh, to your growth as a believer. 